Good afternoon, everybody. Let me um, also start by congratulating Marianne and Kirk and all their colleagues on their support. And boy, are their colleagues as a whole a uh, page of individuals, organizations, and countries involved in this report. I'll spare you the hype because Simon's already been through it. It is a really excellent and thorough report. I don't think, actually, if you looked for a, an authoritative source on the steady debate about climate change and its impact on the world, especially the developing world, I don't think, actually, that I know of a better document than this, so you can give me the money later All right. as well. Um, and I have to say I agree with some of the core emphases, anyway, of the report. That is, first of all, you must have what I would call development imperative. Poorer countries must have the space to develop economically. This is not just for moral reasons, although the moral reasons are strong. Um, it's also for structural reasons. One of the main sources of pressures on sustainability and climate change, for example, is population growth. We know that population growth can only really be controlled through achieving a reasonable level of affluence and through the empowerment of women, so many of these things actually hang together. Second, there does have to be large-scale funding coming from the developed world to the developing world almost impossible to see how we could get anywhere with these issues without that. That means very concretely there has to be an effective replacement so the clean development mechanism uh, Copenhagen or afterwards. Unfortunately, clean development mechanism, I'm sure everyone here will know, has not been a wholly effective um, means of doing this and we'll need larger scale funding than it provided. I think you have to say that uh, our experience with carbon trading has also been um, pretty iffy at the moment. The first phase of the European trading system, carbon trading system, has not been successful. It's generated lots of money to be transferred around the world, which has helped through the clean development mechanism. But has it helped bring down emissions within the European countries? Uh, it, it has not. Or if it has, very small, by, only by a very small amount. Now, I'd, I'd like to suggest a different approach from that ordinarily taken when one looks at climate change uh, uh, politically and in global terms. The usual approach, and as the approach of the developing world, is to say, sorry, the developed world, is to say to the developing world, China, India, Brazil, et al., look, we in the advanced countries have set ourselves rigorous targets. Are you going to come on board? I would argue for a reversal of the spotlight being as important. That is, the rest of the world should put the focus on the industrial countries and ask them, have you got your act together? Um, in the report, uh, the authors speak of the need for immediate and aggressive action by the high-income countries to shrink their carbon emissions. And this is completely true. You know, you've got Copenhagen, Agreements may or may not be reached, but in truth, most will depend on what the industrial countries do. Most will depend upon the how rather than the what. And much of this will have to be carried at a national level within the industrial countries. So it makes, to me, complete sense to focus uh, with some, in some detail upon what's actually happening in the industrial countries and whether they are in the game that they're all so busy talking about. What do we find? Well, as Simon said, I wrote a whole book on this, but I just want to summarize two or three, well, three or four, well, four or five <laughs> uh, little themes quickly. First, if you look across the industrial countries, you find that some have been quite successful in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. But this is only a small cluster. It's countries like Sweden, Denmark, um, France because of, of nuclear power and so forth. You have an enormous tail of countries which are nowhere near even meeting their modest Kyoto targets. I just came back from talking about climate change in Italy. I mean, they're not, it's not even in the game in terms of public discussions. I don't know what Mr. Berlusconi is interested in. Well, maybe I do, but, you know, I don't think he holds these parties in order to discuss reducing Italy's greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions. What, what I also found, something I think which is very pertinent to this report, 
and quite sobering is that those countries which are in the lead in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions are not by and large in the lead because of climate change policy. They are in the lead because they responded to the first oil crisis of the late 1970s. They took fright at their um, uh, lack of energy security and they started making changes. This was true of Denmark, for example, to move towards wind power, true of Sweden with its interesting innovations in regional power, true of France, uh, which gets about 80% of its electricity from um, nuclear power. So, you know, the, the, these countries, the majority of industrial countries, actually a long way off the game when you actually pin them down about it. And this is very significant because this must change, and it must change in the short term, and good intentions, not enough. How must it change? Well, this is my second point, and it comes back to what Simon was talking about. We must have a politics of the long term. We're not used to having a politics of the long term in the industrial countries. We're not used to it. This is, this is something where it, you, you can converge with recovery from the financial crisis in principle. There will be a greater role for the state, but just as important to me will be how you make markets function over the long term. We know that markets are not inherently short term. We know that we will need very important role for markets in, in coping with climate change, but we have to find a way of focusing them on the long term. For example, if you take the issue that uh, occupies me a lot and is discussed in the report, the issue of insurance. Insurance is going to play a major role in that adaptation since all countries will have to adapt to already existing climate change. If you look at the Caribbean, you have an uh, increasing curve which looks like increasing intensity of the storms uh, that occur there on a regular basis. Um, poorer people will need to be insured against the consequences of more severe storms. We know from Hurricane Katrina that st the state can only cover um, a small proportion of this. Even a rich state can only cover a small proportion of damage involved. Therefore, most <coughs> excuse me, will have to be covered by um, the private insurance industry. We need government to work with that insurance industry to try to develop long-term catastrophe bonds. Some such things are in existence, but a lot more work needs to be done on them. It's only exa an example of what you could say is a paradigm shift, really, which is going to have to happen in the relationship between state and markets. I, you know, I don't see it as just a return to the traditional state. I think that's hopeless. I think you know, we're going to need a new long-term regulatory framework, actually, which we're far from having worked out uh, properly. Third, we have to confront the issue of left and right, as Simon says, within the industrial countries. And we have to set up a political system, as far as we can, where climate change is not polarized between left and right. In this country, we've been quite successful. I spoke in the debates on the climate change bill and the energy bill in the Lords, and we had a very pleasing degree of political consensus. Will it last when, if and when, let me say, as a Labour person, David Cameron gets into power? We don't know. Possibly it will. But when you look around the world, in most industrial countries, climate change is politically polarised, and this radically inhibits the capability of developing long-term policy about it. The most serious case in the world at the moment is the United States, uh, where uh, the Republicans by and large object to all aspects of Obama's package, their objections to state intervention in the economy and to health care feed into their objections to the climate change bill. He has a problem of keeping the, the Democrats together on the climate change bill. The result is a severe weakening of this bill. We don't even know where it will get through the Senate, or although probably some version of it will. This is likely strongly to inhibit what the world needs, which is forceful American leadership on climate change issues. People in the develop world, developing world see these things happening, and they say, well, this is a weak position for the United States, and indeed, in principle, it is. I think the left has a strong responsibility here because the left has claimed climate change as its issue with phrases like, uh, green is the new red. Climate change, I can't stress too strongly, is not a left-right issue. We will not be able to cope with it unless we get a general consensus among a substantial proportion of citizens that long-term policy, with the costs involved, is a necessity politically within the industrial countries. 
Thirdly, I think we're not going to get anywhere, as Kirk says, if we just focus on catastrophe. Catastrophe does not mobilize citizens, partly because there are many catastrophes around. Pick up your newspaper every day, you see the imminence of, of, um, of swine flu, before that avian flu, possibility of Iran getting nuclear weapons. Very hard for ordinary citizens to insert abstract climate change catastrophe, which haven't, hasn't even happened yet into this discourse. Um, two American um, environmentalists, um, Schellenberger and Nordhaus, not the same Nordhaus who was mentioned before, made themselves famous in the American environmental community when they said that Martin Luther King wouldn't have got anywhere if he said, I have a nightmare. In other words, we'll need a positive motivating a vision of a future society. We need something which will positively motivate the citizenry. People do respond, for example, much better to the idea of clean energy and energy security than they do directly to climate change, at least many people among the population. It might surprise you to know that uh, surveys show that about 40% of the population of most industrial countries are climate change skeptics anyway. That is, they don't accept that there is a consensus among scientists that climate change is real, that it's caused by human activity, and that it's potentially catastrophic for us. So we, I think we need a new set of mobilizing ideals, which the Sustainable Development Commission has been doing interesting pioneering work on. Finally, we do need to rethink the whole notion of growth and development, as the report, I think, to some extent says, although I think we have to be probably a lot more radical about it. Development is necessary in the poorer parts of the world, yes, but you can argue that the industrial countries are overdeveloped. That is, that sheer economic development brings almost as many problems as it does solutions if you measure them in terms of welfare. This has become very well known in the literature on happiness, that it, people don't get more content uh, above a certain level of economic development. But when you look around, you look at the role of the motor car, for example, the motor car was an instrument of freedom and liberation. Well, you're hardly free and liberated if you're stuck in a bloody traffic jam in the middle of a city or you can't get any way, anywhere on the freeway. So personally, I think, you know, this is a huge intellectual task which we face of thinking what kind of society will have to come into being, especially within the industrial world, if we're going to have a chance of containing climate change within regional limits. So, I think it's not just a matter of you know, on-the-ground facts, which the report is very good at. It's also a matter of imagination. To some extent, certain util a utopian element will be needed to think of what kind of society we can reasonably bring into being. What we know is it has to look different from our existing one, I think. We, industrial civilization is unsustainable, not just because of climate change, but because of other resources in the world. No previous generation has had to face up to this, I don't think. And I think y the task before us, therefore, is a huge one. And you remember that Francis Fukuyama, a few years ago, wrote this book, The End of History, and said, well, we can't think of any other kind of society except the one we know is the best democratic society informed by an open competitive market economy. Well, that can no longer be true. You know, not only uh, can we think of another kind of society from the current evolution of the industrial countries, we absolutely must do, precisely because we know that we're up against a major, major, major block in terms of future economic development. So I think we're at the beginning, not at the end, of a long intellectual road, actually. Thank you very much.